welcome to the course International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. Today we are going to talk about culture, identity and buildings. Before I speak about culture, let us take us a deeper concepts of who we are. So let's start with a very fundamental question of who am I? I am not the only one who have asked this question. Various scholars, including philosophers like great saints like Ramana Maharshi, who actually talked about who am I, you know, it's talking about taking the self, the body and the mind and relating it to this universe, you know. So it's a very complex uh, phenomenon which is going to be discussed in both anthropological terms and sociological terms. And here we are trying to relate in the studies of vernacular architecture. Let me start with a very basic understanding. When you or me, anyone who is born, what is our identity? We are first identified as an individual or is it something else which is defining us? The moment we come to this world, the very first identity, that's the very first identity, is our family. Our mother, our father, our relationships with our siblings. So the moment you are born, you are obviously your first identity is your family. Your son and son of so and so, or a daughter of so and so, or a grandson of so and so, or the granddaughter of so and so. So this becomes a very first unit of your identity. If you slightly expand this, then immediately there are other things which layers you. What is your religion? Are you a Hindu? Are you a Muslim? Are you a Christian? What is a caste? In countries, in the, some of the developing countries, we talk about the caste, you know, which, which sub-caste you belong to because you are defined through a particular organizational process. The next layer, which is we are talking about what place we are representing. Are you a native of a small village by name X? Are you a part of a small district? Then obviously it defines a part of a particular state, a country, a continent. You know, So this is how our sense of place is associated not just in a very simple scale but it it expands to the from a small room from a small dwelling to a continent level so how am i associated with these places this who am i how he is associated with these places first of all am i a man am i a woman Am I a transgender? Let's say we say when women born in Philippines or in Lakshadweep or in Bhutan which has certain matrilineal processes which means the inheritance of a property the, how it has to be exchanged from one generation to the another generation how the property comes from mother to the daughter and who after the marriage who goes to from which house to which house so all these equations will be defined the moment your gender is defined and where you are born. The same woman who was born in Indian mainland will have, will have to go through a different process. The same woman who, have, who was born in a country like Philippines, they have to undergo through a different process. So the definitions of their belonging, the definitions of their mobilities, it is all defined with these gender processes. Am I a rich? Am I a poor? Am I religious? Am I atheist? And what caste I do belong to? Am I a Brahmin? Am I a Catholic? Am I a Muslim? Am I a Sikh? You know, so all these layers which defines certain um, processes, how you lead your life in the next uh, stages. Then when you grow up, what are your political views? Are you a liberal democrat? Are you a conservationist? What is your views on it? So how do so how do you perceive this world? 
you know so your position towards this world view is also important and most importantly out of all these it is someone is telling you that yes you are a man you are a woman you are a rich you are poor you are religious you are atheist at the same time you are communicating to them and you are actually not really an individual here you are actually a prisoner of an organization or a social institution which has been defined with various cultural geographical context now what is the scale of the space we are talking about the very first association when you are born it starts with your home a simple household your mother or father and let us imagine we all have started our life in a very defined continent very defined uh, political world let's take an example of what tom hanks have depicted in his movie in castaway so he was a fedex courier person unfortunately he met with an accident and he found himself in a lone island there's no human being been there and he himself was a lone survivor there and he survives there for about 4 years now the whole movie is about almost the three fourth movie is all about how he survives in that lone island so he starts making preparing his fire he starts reinventing his fire you know then he started you know finding out how to fish so he start you know almost living a kind of nomadic or a tribal way of life you know like where he just living hunting the fish cooking it and you know for, then eating it so one day one of the parcel which was missed out in this accident it comes to the shore and he founds a small ball which is a gift and he takes that ball and he paints it Uh, with a small human face and he names it as a wilson and whenever he feels angry whenever he want to talk to someone whenever he want to share some of his grief or happiness or sorrow anything he used to talk to that non living thing which is a ball but he imagines that he it is a living thing for him it is something or someone whom he can cuddle with whom he can talk with whom he can be become angry with so this wilson has been a part of his all his four year life and the climax of it you know the almost uh, towards the end he finally he prepares uh, a small floating ship i mean floating boat and then he travels around and in the middle of his journey he somehow misses this wilson and he really struggles as though his real a uh, family member have been missed out he really struggles to so that is a kind of intimacy a person has develops with sharing certain things you know though though it's just a simple ball but for him it is someone who took care of him who was there with him you know so this is where we talks about how the sax definitions places cannot exist without us but equally important we cannot exist without place so until tom hanks reaches to this island you know there is a sense of place has not been created so it was a simple space with a natural geographical fact you know elements in it then he started modifying uh, that particular place for his needs for his local needs for his survival needs so that's how we say a place is a survival instinct and it is also referred as territorial instinct you know how you defines your geographical place your belonging your sense of belonging let's say when we start about a small home in the japanese traditional houses we have this japanese tokonoma which is a kind of sacred space and here they follow certain practices even whenever the guest comes they try to uh, you know the uh, turn their back towards the tokonoma so that you know so they have certain uh, procedures how they make them the guests sit over in this place so similarly you know there is a hierarchical order the toko bashira the the central wooden post which they you know they 
it actually segregates certain places and they display certain uh, font over there and obviously there are certain display items which are kept in a hierarchical order. So a sacred space starts within a small room and let me tell you how people are associated with these sacred spaces. It could be a small idol and how people respond differently. Let's say I tell you one of uh, an important uh, understanding in my own life. I was living in Bhopal and my mother came to see me and she was from South India. She lived all her life in the southern part of India and I was working in uh, Central India and for the first time she travelled and she started staying for a few days with me and initially I observed she was not very happy. Then I asked her what was the reason. She said, you know, in my hometown I used to go to a temple, Durga Devi temple, every day and uh, I am missing my Durga. So then I found out a small temple which has an idol made of marble and I showed her, okay, why don't you go to this Durga temple? Then she started going to the temple. But even after a few days, I asked her, why you are still dull? She said, my Durga, which I go regularly, is so furious. She is black in color. But here, I am not able to associate my Durga here. So which means, you know, that in symbolic expressions are actually, uh, you know, she is linked with that symbolic expressions, whether it is the color of the idol, the furious nature of the idol. You know, here she says that, you know, uh, for me, the Durga and the Krishna, both of them are smiling. So in that way, I'm not able to relate with my what I have seen as a habitual experience from my past. So this is something very important uh, observation. And I try to relate, you know, what uh, Gaston Bachelard talks about, uh, a geographer's Yufu Thuan's term called topophilia in the book of Poetics of Space, and that's the life of the mind is given form in the places and spaces in which people dwell, and those places influence human memories, feelings, and thoughts. So it could be a color, it could be a certain semiotic element, but you know that that is how people were associated with it. In the context of Tom Hanks, it was not a living thing, but he was associating as though it was someone who is sharing with a life with him. You know. So when we talk about this topophilia, it is a practice that can actively produce places for people. As I said, you know, we all become a kind of prisoners of these social institutions, whether it is a matrilineal society, whether it is a patrilineal society. For example, in Maasai compound in Kenya, you know, somehow it's a polygamous society where he has his whole dwelling unit is, you know, has been uh, oriented in such a direction that you have the place for the sheep and cattle, there's a headman's room, there is a first wife, the second wife, the third wife. You know, so that is how the whole orientation of the dwelling is done. Like Amos Rappaport, he talks about how the monogamous and the polygamous orientations of these dwellings, you know, how, for instance, you have this principal wife, the second wife, the third wife, and you have this kitchen and the sheep. And whereas here it is just a single person, the head of the family, the wife and children, the grandmother, the calf, place for calf, and the kitchen and the granaries. So it actually... Uh, how you are positioned in a society and how it defines your small space of a dwelling, your belief systems, how it has to orient your small worship space, how you can actually conduct your processes of your life. So let's take it further, whether it is uh, from the home and how it is situated in the neighborhood or in a street. And this is where we talk about the spaces of life. For instance, uh, in a place like Sri Rangam, you know, you have the central deity in the center and you have m majority of the Brahman community lives in the uh, immediate concentric uh, rectangle of Sri Rangam. And then you can see that there's a huge barriers which were constructed from each of these clusters. And so they also have, on the festival uh, occasions, they also have these uh, chariot festivals, you know, they take these chariots uh, and processions along these Uttara and Chitra streets and how, uh, where all these people from different castes, different groups, they come together and participate in these events. Not only with the life, but there is also the aspect of dead, the spaces of dead. Like uh, in my own uh, cultures, where we can see in our hometowns, where on the Pongal day, on 
which is usually coming on January 14th of every year. Uh, sometimes it might vary on 15th or so, but what people do is most of these burial traditions, many of them, they come here, they clean their burial places of their ancestors, they decorate it. So it's a process of uh, maintaining these burial grounds and once in a year they come together and they identify and this is one place I think many of the cousins meet there because that is where the knowledge about what uh, who was the dead person and what he likes and some memories to him and it has been translated you know taken it to uh, as an information to the next generations so these are the places where the whole uh, town gathers here for certain year celebrate celebrations you know kind of a, a on the festive day they also keep offer something to the dead and if you take in a uh, you know a larger scale for instance in the mexico where we talk about the altar of dead which is uh, been uh, in the representative list in the indigenous festivity and the whole country you know whether it is um, a, a small child or whether it is families living abroad, they all travel mostly in the month of October, end of October to November and they celebrate a particular period of for the dead. For instance, there are some days which are dedicated for the people who died with some certain diseases, there are people who have, there are some days which are dedicated for the children, like that they travel across and that is how it has become a part of the, uh, you know, the representative list in the UNESCO. And today all these festivities are getting modified because of various western influences coming over because the people who travels abroad and, they, and when they come back they take certain things what they already knew and also what they have experienced in other places. Now when we talk about the streets, this is an example of Tarangambadi, it's a small fisherman settlements where you can see this is mostly the colonial structures are evident here and the pre-colonial which is mainly occupied by the Muslim community and this is the fisherman community. So in fact if you ever go to this colonial side, this is where you can see the whole uh, and the grand entrance gateways, the bungalows, the beach bungalow, the Dansburg fort, all this colonial, this is called Kingsway, you know. So uh, it is actually reflected in the way the streets, the scale of the street, the, um, you know, the connections with the street. So, but the only connection which actually connects all these communities is the Princess Street. You know, that is where it connects the Hindu, Muslim and the Christian communities together. And if you look at the pre-colonial houses, this is where you can see uh, the traditional houses where they have, uh, and even the fishermen houses. So they have this small veranda outside uh, which faces the street front. And it is also in Tamil culture, they talk about the talking streets, you know, in the evenings they come over and they uh, sit outside and they talk to each other. This is the kind of social interaction uh, one can easily understand from this um, uh, you know, the, the nature of the built forms which actually are oriented in the whole street. For example, in the Queen Street, which actually connects all the three communities. But after the tsunami, very few people are walking in this particular street. So now when it comes to, when you scale it up to a village or a town or a city, now, for example, you see this photograph of Doha, 19 and 1950s, and today what the city of Doha looked like. So what are the determinants of these tremendous uh, changes? What, what are the, is it only a social change or it is something, an economic driver? You know, the uh, oil industry has boomed up uh, the economies and has brought all the people across the world. And then how different, uh, you know, economic institutions have shaped this whole city. You know, so what in 50, in 70 years of the time, this is what we can see the whole transformation. And in contrast with certain traditional settlements, like when we were part of course, uh, we were taken to a place called Lefkara in the Greek part of Cyprus. And this is a small town where uh, all the traditional dwellings are built with the stone walls and even the streets, you can see that all the stone paved streets. And uh, interestingly, after the war, 
between the Turkish part of the Cyprus and the Greek Turks and the Greeks. So you can see many of the houses are still abandoned, you know. The Turks who were living in the Greek part, they left to the Turkish part. Similarly, the Greeks who were living in the Turkish part, they left to the other side. So now these houses, who owns these houses, you know, they have ownership of it. And many of these houses are left abandoned like that. So there are many issues of how the generational uh, changes, like for example, many of them went into as a bartenders or many other newer uh, income sources. But the traditional, the embroidery work and what the women used to make, so now the youngsters, they are not relying on these traditional uh, livelihoods. So they are trying to, because uh, get attracted with some other jobs in the nearby cities. So in that way, what happens to the village fabric, you know, what happens? So uh, in fact, the perception of what the youngsters perceive about this village and what the elderly people perceive about it, because they have a lot of attachments with this village, you know. So this is where uh, we were doing some uh, studies and we started, uh, you know, giving certain recommendations how we can address, make some small changes in this particular settlement so that it can sustain with their local economies and it can sustain with the built fabric of this particular place. So let's scale it up further and when we talk about the state, you know, so earlier in India there's a state of Andhra Pradesh and recently it has been split into Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, you know. So now the moment it has split up, obviously when my classmates, when we were studied together in Hyderabad, you know, we all were representing Andhra Pradesh. But today, the identity, our slang, our food habits, you know, everything, though we are more or less similar, but slightly the different uh, aspects has been highlighted. And now each one of these state is looking for creating their own identities you know, looking at their own cultures, like the way they celebrate the Bonal festivals here and the way they celebrate these Pushkarams here, you know. So all these are actually the culture plays an important role, how each community could be defined. Here we talk about dividing a state, but how about the Nicosia, you know, a city which is divided between two countries, the Lefkosa on the upper side and the Greek part of Cyprus, which is the Nicosia. So the UN buffer zone actually divides between and the city is divided between two countries. So which means uh, there is a socio-political influences how people define their own spaces. Now from a monumental level, I think this is one classical example of the Babri Masjid where uh, whether the Rama uh, has been uh, is an evident source or the Babur uh, the Babri Masjid was there. So there's a lot of conflict which went on. And of course, such sites are always there. And uh, some conclusions have been derived in different time, you know, with uh, different possible uh, references. But what we are trying to hear, uh, to learn about is a sense of place, it, which is actually a part of the politics of the identity. And it is also a sense of place can be seen as a kind of cultural uh, interpretation. And it is a way how we create a sense of belonging by opposing others' identity. You know, that is also a process. So let me tell you uh, about one more case in Turkey, in Taksim Square, about this Gaji Park. Earlier, there used to be an uh, Ottoman times barracks, and an Armenian architect have designed this barracks. And uh, this is the Taksim Square in Istanbul. And in recently, the Erdogan's government, they have proposed, they come up with redevelopment because earlier this has been demolished, the whole barracks has been demolished and it has been converted as a Gaji Park. And for all these 60 years, this park was evident that is one of the large urban green space in the center of Istanbul. And now the new government have brought uh, a proposal that we should build back similar structure of what the Armenian uh, barracks is, you know. So, which has certain impressions from the Indian and the Islamic architecture. And so, now when the proposal is brought forward, now see the same uh, people, you know, the people of this particular country, the whole nation have come forward that they made all the protest because they were cutting down some trees. You know, so we, uh, what we really can understand here is once upon a time that was a pride, but once the same, the same image when it is brought back, you know, how people were responding to these changes. 
So, when you look at the traditions, you know how they are connected at a, not only at a national level from the intercontinental passages. We talk about Silk Route, we talk about the Spice Route, people traveled across. You know, so this is one route like even if you see that there are uh, traditionally people who have come to India, you know, from Afghanistan and other places and even from the China and Tibetan uh, routes. So, you have this Uttarapad and Pubnapad and Aparnapad and we have this Dakshinapad. So, here if you look at it, there is uh, silk routes and we have these Indo-Tibetan corridors where one of my PhD student Samiksha Srichandan is currently working on this documenting these uh, routes because these are the transhumans routes. So, people used to come and collect the salt and everything from uh, you know from the plain areas and they used to go to the higher mountain regions and they used to collect the fruits and vegetables from there they used to bring it to the plain. So, in that way they used to travel by the donkeys and, and they take they travel for months together to reach to the higher places. That is how the trade routes uh, do exist. So, in fact, there are, when all these processes were happening after the 1961 war, so now there has been certain restrictions on these movements and moreover, uh, now the number of people who are going up and down because that has gradually reduced. There are many other uh, changes which are happening with the society. One is people are some of them have migrated, some of their houses are still abandoned and there are some, still some evident practices, you know, how what they brought from the Tibet, whether it is a kind of um, uh, tangible uh, building elements they have brought, whether they are uh, talking about certain tangible, uh, intangible celebrations, whether it is the festivals they conduct and which has uh, which has certain sense of protecting their forest, protecting their farmlands. So, each and every intangible associations, you know, with the nature is always to do with the safeguarding these nature. And gradually, when these movements have dropped down, definitely there is certain decline we can see in these uh, tangible and intangible forms. So, still one can actually uh, notice that, you know, still some families do go and in fact, uh, Samiksha is actually traveling with them and she is actually documenting all these aspects. And what we are learning here, it is not just only about a community here and it is when they travel to Tibet, what they take from India to Tibet and when they travel from Tibet to India, what they bring from here to there. You know, in a similar example, when we took about the continental, uh, one of our student uh, in uh, work on the production of the refugee place in time, I will just show you a few glimpses of as a German exchange student, she was uh, documenting some of the work even in abroad where we can see the Sri Lankan refugees who have settled uh, for a long time in Paris, you know, how they modified their places even in Paris, the, how they celebrate their festivals, the local festivals there in the same way. This is the way the, media, the mediating with the local culture with the foreign culture, you know. So, how they could able to see, bring these elements into their built forms you know, with their religious association. So, the moment you go to any other place in London like Wembley or East Ham or South Hall, you actually can able to relate that, you know, uh, the kind of performatives they function and the kind of built fabric that has been adjusted or negotiated with the foreign cultures. So, she actually worked on the Tibetan refugees when they migrated to India and they were initially set up in a tent house, tents, you know, for in, and then uh, some of them were taken to Ladakh, some of them were taken to Dehradun, some of them they were taken to Karnataka. So, like for example, she studied how the same Tibetan group, how they settled in Ladakh, how they settled in Dehradun, how they settled in uh, a much remote area in Karnataka. And uh, initially they were given some farmlands and say because they were the, farm, the farming backgrounds and they also from the handicrafts and they also for have this one person from the family, they are sent to the monastery to become a monk. So, even still uh, it is evident that one of their family member is going to become a monk. So, initially when they were given a kind of uh, uh, refugee housing, so how they gradually modified it and you know, so these are some of the old camps and the new camps and how 
they gradually adjusted with this process and they followed these gunta systems and you know so one gunta is about 33 uh, feet into 30 uh, feet you know so and about 40 gunta is about one acre so you can see that you know how initially they were given in a kind of uh, linear layouts and gradually well, one after another they started building these uh, you know the new additions to these to the next to their neighborhoods and this is how they started developing you know they are actually uh, still continuing certain things what they brought from Tibet at the same time they are also adjusting with what they are learning from the local regions you know so this is where we can see certain elements are still uh, represented in there, whether in terms of monasteries, whether in terms of their temples, you know, all these they are able to uh, reflect. And at the same time, the local addressing the local climatic conditions, you know, whereas in the Tibetan they have you can have these rammed earth constructions, which is not seen here. But uh, whatever the materials they were able to get with the brick and concrete and the tiles, the Mangalore tiles, you know, so that is how they were able to adapt to this. And uh, so, what we can actually learn from this case is, you know, so how the local climatic conditions, how their local resources, actually um, uh, people try to negotiate with it, people try to adapt to this, how they can actually enhance their abilities to adapt. So, on a, on a overall, what we talk about is you know, how an individual becomes a social individual. So we started with where we were born and then how it, he started interacting with his organizations, with his workplace, with his um, state, with his village, with his country, with his nation, with his uh, intercontinental relationships. You know, that is how uh, they are related. So I would like to uh, sum up all these with uh, a nice stereotypical understanding what Martin Hedegas uh, talks about in being in time. because. It is our body, you know, which is traveling to different places, and and our mind is actually uh, understanding those places. At the same time, our mind is taking something what we already know, you know. So this is where actually we talk about what ties the place and the self together, and how uh, how much time that engagement is actually tying them. For example, when when I was a child. I always loved my hometown, but then when we moved on further, further different places, so the association with where you are living for more than 20 years, 30 years at another place, so how your definition of home also matters a lot, you know. So who are there in your hometown, who, you know, and after 40 years, do you still want to go back to your home? What really pulls you back? You know, so these are all very uh, fundamental questions one has to be uh, really looking at, you know, what ties these places. So, uh, Heidegger points out that, you know, these are constructed, our places are constructed within our memories and our affections and we, that are repeatedly uh, encountered and with a very complex associations. And that is where he talks about this complex association of many asso things which are that worked with an individual and how he prepares himself as a social individual. That process he talks about as a dwelling is the capacity to achieve a spiritual unity between humans and the things. And let's summarize things. We start with our work as an individual, you know, and we started looking at, you know, how our immediate society, whether it is a family or whether it is uh, it is our village, whether it is town, how it actually defines you, you know, in a, in a way how you interact with that and how it shapes your culture, how it shapes how you eat, what you eat, you know, uh, how you perform your worship, how you marry, how you obey, you know, everything is defined within your immediate circumstances. And then when you start growing up, obviously when you start interacting with your uh, neighbors, with your friends, with your fellow mates, and what you learn from them, you know, that's again feeding back. At the same time, you again give it back to that, right? And then when you move out for your jobs further, you know, so that is where when I moved from my hometown, I was always referred to, I came from Nellore, a small town. But then when I moved from Andhra to some other place, you know, I always say I'm from Andhra. When I moved from out of India, I always say I'm from India. When I moved out of uh, uh, India and we were all having some gathering, you know, there was some person who was from Japan, someone from Middle East, someone from Pakistan, then we always say, yes, we are from Asia, 
you know so which means we represented certain similarities though we are differentiated with uh, many other habits but we were representing one continent in when i was studying in london so this is where both the continental and the intercontinental relationships and how we position ourselves where and how is a very complex uh, phenomenon which we really need to understand when and these all these associations are reflected in our place making processes i hope you understand this concept how from the individual and how it relates to the place and its buildings and and how the identity changes with the time a time is also a, a major important factor thank you very much mm -hmm.